Well, good morning. <laughs> And Happy New Year 2020 to all of those of you who were absent last week. <laughs> you can tell I'm a school teacher. We, <laughs> we talked about last week how very, uh, what an auspicious number for this year 2020 is because it's also the number, of course, for perfect vision, 2020 vision. And that is what our aim is this year around here is 2020 vision clarity. Now to help us do this, we have more and more wonderful classes. I hope, how many of you all are reading your emails and scrolling all the way down? Not enough of you are doing your homework. Okay, go all the way down. We have some 13 classes now for you to go to and they'll all help you, all these activities at Unity. And we soon have our um, Reverend Robert Brummett from Unity Village, Mr. Unity Village, we call him, and he will be in residence here for a month starting this Saturday. So we've got four Saturday workshops. We have him uh, doing those, the Wednesday, not Wednesday night classes. We've got four truth lessons he's doing, question and answer session after each truth lesson. So we have a wonderful uh, a group of activities for you and we have a new class starting after Mardi Gras too which is kind of a surprise I'll tell you about later but it's all to help you develop your 2020 vision seeing clearly with clarity of vision 2020 vision you can see the path to reach your destination which for all people as the Dalai Lama says is happiness that's where we all want to be. We're not talking about the instant gratification for programmed or often material momentary pleasures here. We're talking about that deep lasting happiness, that permanent happiness. And getting there is like any voyage that you take. You have to be able to see your path in order to get to your destination. For example, Part of being able to see clearly to true happiness is to utilize your wisdom. You have to activate that part, that one of the 12 powers of Charles Fillmore, your wisdom, which allows you to see through your blurred vision, maya, illusion. For example, unity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, to mention but a few, say that all life is one. There is only one power and one presence in this universe, as we say to start every service every Sunday. We're all part of this interconnected and interdependent energy. When we live at odds with that principle, we are unhappy. Oh, maybe momentarily we'll end up uh, one upping a competitor or winning a war maybe, but in the long run, we're stuck with a lack of peace and joy. You know the expression, no one wins a war. Well, this is true for personal wars and world wars. For example, the United States has won several wars in the last few decades, they tell us. But we're, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to be political. <laughs> what happens when I go off script. Um, but we're 17 trillion dollars in debt. Everyone loses wars of all kinds and sizes. When we live according to the oneness of all life, we're happy. When we let our hatred and greed and prejudice and egos run our lives, we may think we've made a touchdown, but we soon find out we've crossed the wrong goal. Now, presuming we get oriented and clearly see the right goal, what are some of the strategies for getting there? Well, they're pretty much the same ones for football, which I know nothing about, I'll admit. <laughs> So please excuse me, I did not call the head of the board, Bert, who's our football player, to ask him. But first of all, in football, it seems to me you have to play as a team, right? All right, one player's ego might want to go out there and really show off and, for a minute, and he may do that. But if he isn't a team player, his team will probably lose. 
Am I safe so far? (laughs) What else besides team playing does it take to win a football team? Basically, again, the same thing it takes to win the game of life. The 12 powers that Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore talked about and that they just sang about. For example, last week we talked about wisdom, the wisdom to know, for example, that playing as part of the team and not just showing off individually is crucial. We talked about faith, just as in football. You've got to have faith in yourself and your team players and in your coach. We need understanding, an understanding of the rules and the plays. That's truth. Spiritually, we need to understand truth and the eternal laws of life. And we talked about elimination. Elimination involves letting go of what doesn't serve one's goals, maybe old habits or lifestyles or ideas that hold us back in one way or another. Drew Brees wouldn't have gotten very far if he had lived on junk food, stayed out too late every night, partied all the time, and lounged around watching Netflix instead of going to practice sessions, right? (laughs) Still safe, right? We need to eliminate what is detrimental to reaching our goals. Today, I'd like to zero in on co-founder Charles, Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore's powers among his 12 powers of strength, will, order, and love. Strength, will, order, and love. And remember, you possess all 12 of these powers. Everyone does. They just need to be activated. First of all, strength. Strength involves stability and tenacity. If we don't have strength and tenacity, we'll get carried away by the first distraction that comes along. It's kind of like having a spiritual attention deficit syndrome. Often when we take a vow, make a promise or a commitment to maybe a New Year's resolution for ourselves, we're totally sincere at the time we do it. But if we lack strength, we're gonna get sidetracked the first time something more exciting or interesting comes along. Then maybe 10 or 20 years later, we might remember the commitment we made and wonder what in the world happened. This reminds me of the story of the man who committed to being a monk. I don't know if it's a Christian monk or a Buddhist monk at this point, but it's the same. He gave up all his belongings except his monk's robes. And he was very happy to finally be on the path toward godliness. Then after a few months, he started noticing every morning that his robes were kind of chewed up and they were looking really raggy. In fact, the monk's robe finally hardly covered him up anymore. (laughs) He was downright indecent in town. He was baffled by the whole thing, so he stayed awake one night to try to figure out what was happening during the night. He saw the culprit, a big mouse, who gnawed on his robe during the night. So the monk decided the best thing to do was to get a cat. No problem. Plenty of stray cats around, right? But after a few weeks, he noticed that the cat was looking rather skinny. So the monk decided to get a cow that would produce milk for the cat. He borrowed a little money from the local bank and bought a little cow. After a period of time though, he noticed that the cow was looking rather thin and he wasn't producing much milk either. The monk decided to purchase a little plot of land so the cow could graze. He borrowed a little more money to buy the land. To repay the bank, he had to grow enough food though for his cow and a little extra to sell. This worked fairly well, but it didn't quite cover expenses. So he took out a little bit bigger loan and he bought a little more land and he had to hire some people though to help him work that land. It was too big for him, but soon he got, uh, everything was working, but he decided that he could save even more if he started a small little grain mill right there and so he started a thriving grain practice. 
uh, business. Of course, he had to take care of the workers and their families. He had them to all manage. He had the bankers to impress so they would have confidence in his ability to repay the loans. And he needed to inspire all the people in his town who bought his grain so that the competitors wouldn't impress him more. So the monk started wearing fine clothes to do this. He bought a fancy car and he purchased a beautiful house where he entertained all of his clients and banker friends. All went exceedingly well. Then one fine day, the head monk from the regional monastery arrived in town and went down to the river's edge where the monk had lived under a tree. The head monk wanted to see how his protege was doing with the austere life that he had chosen. To his great surprise, the head monk saw his student driving down the street in his fine car wearing his fancy suit. He waved him down. His devoted student, the monk, was so happy to see his teacher. Then the teacher said, what is going on? <laughs> I went out to the hut where you were living by the stream, and in place of it, I saw this huge estate with many workers and a granary. When I inquired about you, they told me you were the owner of this fine house and all the land and the granary. His disciple answered, well, <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> My monk's robes were getting chewed up by a mouse, so I got a cat. The cat needed more food, so I got a cow to get milk, and the cow looked skinny, so I had to buy some land on which he could graze. I couldn't till the field alone, so I hired others. And so the story goes. Strength and tenacity <laughs> are essential. Another of Fillmore's 12 powers is will. Will is basically making the commitment in the first place. It's choosing our goal. It's having the willingness to choose a goal. In spiritual terms, it's committing to your path. You will yourself. You bind yourself to that path in the first place. By starting toward any goal, you have to commit to one and then start in the right direction. And of course, you have to be able to clearly see your way on that path all the way, which is what we're talking about, clarity of vision. A unity prayer says, by the light of will, I choose, I commit, I am willing. Another of Fillmore's 12 powers is order. We have to organize our lives. We have to adjust in order to get the desired results. For example, my students don't take French five before they take French one and two. If a beginner does register for the French five class, they will just waste their time because the material will all go right over their heads. They won't learn anything. They might think it's more impressive to themselves and to others to take French five, but the order of things is off. They won't get anywhere. Order is very important on the spiritual path too. Spiritual bypasses don't work. We may talk, act, and think we're in the spiritual five class, but if we haven't mastered the basics we are wasting our time. For example, we may talk about being one with and loving everyone, and we may really want to be on that level, but if we haven't done the basic inner work that is necessary, we'll find that we just can't have compassion for and feel at one with all people all the time in our hearts. We need to do that deep inner work that is often necessary to determine why we don't see others with Christ's vision. This may involve doing maybe some shadow work or some therapy, which could feel like a beginner's class, but it's absolutely necessary. <coughs> know thyself. Maybe we notice that another person's actions or words or political beliefs or anger or something 
bothers us, it angers us, surefire feedback that we have inner work to do. And that's okay, that's good. That's why we're here. That's the right order for our advancement. We need to methodically find out why that person angers or scares or stresses us and deal with it. There is a divine order to everything. It's the natural order of life. Wisdom is discovering that for ourselves. We're all different. If you're a gardener, you first notice a little sprig, then the full stem, then the leaves, then the bud, then the full-blown rose. That is the natural order of things. If you try to hasten a butterfly's freedom by helping it out of its cocoon, you will cripple it. We all know that. It will never fly right because the struggle that it goes through to free itself is what helps it develop its wing strength. We must use our wisdom to ascertain the order of things in our lives. Sit, wait, reflect, meditate. It will come to you. Perhaps you're struggling with something right now in your life, like the butterfly, and you may think, woe is me, I've got this thing I'm struggling with in my life. But it might be just the thing you need to develop your spiritual wings so that in the future you can be free of some of the things that cause others to suffer and maybe used to cause you to suffer. Unity says, have faith in the order of things. Have faith in your evolution. Respect the natural order of things and use this idea of order to organize your life in such a way that you will get to your destination one step at a time. And this order might apply to your day too. Think about that. Perhaps <clears throat> you order your day by starting it in prayer or meditation. Maybe you then dedicate your mind, body, and emotions to a higher purpose. You then, or later, included spiritual food, like coming here for services or classes or workshops, reading, listening to the myriad inspiring things available to you on YouTube, and Netflix, arranging these kinds of things, ordering these things into your daily life makes a huge difference in terms of seeing clearly and arriving at your destination. And last but not least is love. I saved it to last because it's very, very hard for us to love unconditionally if we don't use some of the other 12 powers. We can delude ourselves, of course, and think we love people, but then the first time someone does something that rubs our egos the wrong way, we get angry, we burst out, and we say and do things that are not loving, or we feel downright vengeful. Anytime we hear ourselves saying something nasty or negative to or about someone, it's a huge red flag. Not that we're sinful, but that we haven't mastered agape, unconditional love yet. Maybe we find socially acceptable ways to vent that anger. People toward whom we can thrust our negativity because everybody agrees about that person. Maybe some authority figure or group of people that we don't like. But if we're brutally honest with ourselves, such negativity is a sure sign that we need to work on ourselves to help ourselves in order to get to our destination of happiness. We either love and have compassion for every being on earth or we don't. And if we don't, we suffer because we're all connected. It will not lead to happiness Doctors have long said that grief and negativity are two big causes of cancer, for example. Love doesn't usually just happen. 
unless, of course, it's toward our pets or our children. This seems to be pretty natural. We have to clear some of the cobwebs away before we can see the Christ nature or the Buddha nature or higher self nature of most people. We become aware of that when they offend us. We all like to think we're loving people, of course, but the fact is this is usually the area in which we have the most work to do. Anything less than genuine, consistent, unconditional love for everyone will ruin our peace and happiness. It's very important to find out where, why we don't love and have compassion for everyone. We need to own up to our part in it and change those parts of us. This is freedom. This is not being at effect for li in life, but at cause in our lives. This is true liberation. This is enlightenment. It brings us peace and true joy. This change in the way we see things is the miracle that A Course in Miracles talks about. It's a change of perception. Love is looking beyond our judgments. It's understanding that behind all the mistakes and fears and misunderstandings, there is a heart begging to be loved and understood. Agape love, unconditional love, is seeing the one power and one presence in the universe in all people. A spiritual teacher of mine recently said that our egos are malevolent. I really had to think about that one. Our egos are malevolent because all they care about is themselves. When someone says or does something unloving, we just need to understand that they followed their ego in that instance. It is healthy for us to have compassion for them because it's a sure thing that their lives are probably not working very well. Bottom line for love, be honest with yourself, brutally honest. Who do you love just conditionally? Who do you not love at all? That is, who offends your ego? Sometimes they're in your family, there's some authority figure, someone who challenges you or your ideas. Then in meditation, you might consider what triggers you about this person? How can you begin to see the part you are playing in that drama that's making you unhappy and stressed out? Then resolve to work on this. Ask spirit to help you see them differently. You will get your answer. And when you do, you'll be a little closer to freedom and enlightenment, to happiness, to manifesting heaven on earth, to being at cause and not effect in your life. That's liberation. So as you go through this week, think on these things. How can you activate in you strength, will, order, and love so that you can more effectively reach your goal of peace and happiness. Commit to what you want with strength and tenacity so that you won't get sidetracked. Go towards your goal in an orderly way. Have the will to stay the course. And finally, work on the parts of yourself that hold you back from being able to unconditionally love and have compassion for others and yourself. And remember to ask for help. You're not in this alone. Ask for help from spirit and ask for help from others on your path and your sangha. Amen. <laughs>